Hi, I am Jerome from Fastlane. Welcome to this series on the Cisco Unify wireless networking solution. Today I would like to show you how lightweight access points find their controller. As you know, when an access point boots, it tries to find a controller and then joins this controller. If you are using a 1000 series access point, the old airspace access point, they may be using layer 2 discovery process. That is to say, they only use their MAC address to get to the controller, and if the controller is in the same subnet, well, they, they'll find it. Um, all the other access points, all the Airnet series, 1200 series, 1100 series, 1500 series, all these access points do not work at layer 2, they only work at layer 3, which means that the first thing the access point needs to do is to get an IP address. This IP address can be done using a static assignment or it can use a DHCP assignment. In any case, it needs to have a layer 3 existence be before discovering the network. Then, once it has this IP address, the access point is going to try to find controllers. And that's the next step we'll see deeper in the next slide. But the basic idea is that the access point tries to discover as many controllers as it possibly can, so that it can choose among those controllers that answered which controller would be the best for it. Once it gathered that list of several controllers, the access point is going to decide which controller should be joined. And the criteria by which the access point decides which controller is the best one depends on how you configure this access point before. You may configure the access point to have what we call the primary, secondary, or tertiary controller. This is basically a name that you provide to the access point by which you say, if among the answers, this controller, let's say WC1, if among the answers, one controller called WC1 answers, you have to join that one first. If that one doesn't answer, then you can provide the name of a secondary or a tertiary controller. So once the expo will have gathered as many uh, controller information as it possibly could, it's going to look at the answers and check the names of these controllers. If it finds something that matches its primary, secondary or tertiary controller configuration, it's going to join that very controller. If none of these controllers are the primary, secondary or tertiary, or if the access point doesn't have any tertiary, secondary or primary controller configuration, then the access point is going to look at the answers and check if one of them claims to be a master controller. The master controller is basically a feature that you configure on a controller by which you say, if an access point doesn't know which controller to join, you'll be the one it joins. So if the exponent finds no primary, secondary, or tertiary, it's going to try to find if there is one that claims to be the controller, which is a master controller. You should have, of course, only one master controller, right? Otherwise, the exponent will not know which one to join. If there is no primary, secondary, tertiary, and no master controller, well, the exponent will just look at the load on the controllers. In the answers, the controller provides information about its hardware platform, number of access points supported, the number of joined access points, therefore number of available slots, and firmware along with the master controller mode uh, set to yes or no. So the access point is going to look at the number of access points already joined on that controller, on all the controller it, it, it gets answer from, and is going to decide which one is the best to join. This is a um, list load is re a relative concept. What I mean here is that if, for example, you have a 2106 controller, that has one access point join, therefore it has five available slots. And if you have a 4404, for example, that has 50 access points, therefore it has 50 access points available slots. Um, if you compare both, you would say, well, the 2106 has five available slots, and the 4404 has 50 available slots, probably the 4404 is less loaded. Well, no because the load is based on the percentage basis. So the 2106 has six slots, only one is taken, that is to say only 15% of the resources are, are taken. Whereas on the 4404, it has 100 slots, 50 are taken, therefore 50% of the slots are taken. Therefore, there is more space, uh, re relatively speaking, on the 2106 than on the 4404, and the exponent is going to join the, 40, the 2106. Alright, so the exponent tries to find among the list of controllers which one is the best to join, decides to join one, based on all these criteria, primary, master, or least loaded, and then is going to create a tunnel to this controller. That's the join phase. Once the access point has joined the controller, it's going to verify if the controller has 
a new firmware, a newer firmware, or different firmware from the one that the X-Point is running. So if your access point is running, say, 5.2 code, and the controller it joins runs 4.2, the access point will say, hey, I need to downgrade because my code is not the right one. And the other way around, of course, is true. If your controller is running 6.0 and your access point is running 5.1, it's going to say, well, I need to upgrade to 6.0 because my firmware is not right. So whenever there is difference between the controller code and the access point code, the access point is going to join the controller first, then download the new firmware from the controller. But then the access point has to reboot to validate this firmware, which means that the access point reboots and restarts its discovery from scratch, which may make that the second time the access point may join the same controller or may join another controller depending on the load and the network events that may occur in between. This is one of the reasons why we say it's always safer, safer to have the same code on all the controllers in your network. And if you plug an access point for the first time in your network, well, expect the access point to join the controller briefly, then suddenly disconnect, because it has to reboot to validate the load it has now. Alright, so then it joins the controller, and once it has joined this controller, it's going to retrieve its configuration from the controller it joined. If during all this process, the discovery process, the access point could not find any controller, it's going to sulk for a while. So you know what sulking is, right? If you're not native, you, you may not know this word. It's when you're not happy, you stay in your corner for a while. So that's what the access point does. It sulks for a while. I should say it stays idle for a while. And the reason why is not that the access point is not happy. It's because it's think well, the, the developers thought that if the access point couldn't join a controller, it's probably because there was something wrong in your configuration. So instead of sending discovery packets all around it without stopping, it better stop for a while to let you, you know, solve the issue before retrying again. So the access point sucks for a few tens of seconds, then reboots and retry again. Until it finally finds a controller. So that's the process. Now, the question is, how does the access point gather information about controllers? Well, it has a few ways of discovering controllers, and this is probably where uh, we have most issues among customers not understanding how these things work. The access point can send a broadcast to its local domain, uh, send a discovery message to a unicast IP address for a controller it knows, or to receive information from a DHCP server or a DNS server. It can also use what we call over-the-air provisioning of the access points. So all this, this screen is the topic of the next video.